Um, and, and with that, if the finance director would give us a few minutes of presentation and then questions. Uh, hi, everybody. It's good to uh, see you this afternoon. First of all, I would... Um, Hello. I pushed it away. I never should have done that. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. First, uh, let me introduce uh, Donna Foster. Donna F Foster works in the uh, finance department and she handles uh, uh, most of the financial duties uh, within the department for me. Uh, that is not her only responsibility. It is uh, one of many things that she does for me, as do uh, another 100 employees of the uh, Metro Finance Department, many of whom are here today. And um, I know I may be challenged um, from other departments for this, but I would say that they are that they are the elite workforce in this entire government. I respect them uh, and everything that uh, that they do on a daily basis. Some of those folks are in the back of this chamber. Some of those folks are in the back, uh, ready, willing, and able to take questions of this body as we go through the budget process. So. Um, the first thing that I always want to do is make sure that um, I give uh, credit where it is deserved and uh, the folks work uh, diligently every single day to provide service. Uh, in terms of our budget, we absolutely can uh, live with the mayor's uh, recommended budget. We have a couple of items um, within the um, budget that are recommended for the finance department. Uh, one, I think, has uh, the first item that's listed here is $201,000 to update the disparity study. This is what, and uh, I've asked Michelle to stay along here, but I think she has uh, gone through um, everything with, with you all, uh, with Mr. Riebling up here for the mayor's office, because she is heading up that work, but the, um, the function in terms of looking at the purchasing opportunities and stuff, that all happens inside of the finance department. So to complete that study, it will take $201,000. Uh, the last time that a disparity study was done was back in 2004. So it is absolutely time for us to revisit that and to uh, update uh, that data. The second uh, item here is $300,000, and this is for the short-term rental compliance contract, which is uh, still not awarded at, the, at this date. We did go through an RFP process. We had about five or six um, responders, but we did have uh, one vendor uh, to submit a protest, and an appeal hearing is scheduled um, later this month. I think it's the last week of May uh, for the Procurement Appeals Board to um, hear that to hear that appeal from that vendor. Uh, this has been placed in the Finance Department's budget, but it's really for the benefit of at least three different departments that will be using that service, and that includes the uh, Collections Office and Treasury. It also includes codes for the work that they do, and it also includes Metro Legal because the uh, solution that was presented presents um, uh, an opportunity for each of those departments to improve the work that they are doing in terms of tracking compliance around short-term rentals. The last uh, few items, one is just a, um, a grant adjustment, and then we have a couple of small um, internal service fee adjustments. And then finally, you'll see a, a, an item listed there of non-recurring money that's going away. Uh, this body granted us $125,000 in the current year budget to do a study of, uh, I wanna make sure that I say this right, what PCI stands for, payment card industry. These are some new regulations regarding credit card security. And so this was a project that was uh, begun in consultation or in collaboration with the Department of ITS to make sure that uh, we are in compliance with all credit card regulatory issues. Uh, we have retained the firm. We've received some preliminary assessments, but uh, that study is not ready for uh, release yet, but we continue to work with ITS on that. But that, um, that funding will not be needed into the next year's budget, so it is being removed from finances 
budget for FY18. Okay, and with that. Well, thank you, Director. We'll and take questions. to Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. And Chair, if I may, I'm gonna ask you to indulge one question because it does not deal with the Finance Department's uh, budget, but I, I would like to ask the question, uh, over the last year or so, we had Metro uh, General, Nashville General, come up and ask us for money. And if you remember one of the questions I asked you, if we defer this, um, what happens? And we were told literally, if we don't pass it now, they can't meet payroll. So here's my question to the Finance Department. Uh, one of the questions, I've got about three or four. One of the questions is, how do we be more transparent to where this body is not caught off guard when all of a sudden we need 10 million or 15 million dollars from one department? How, how do we make sure that you guys are keeping us in the loop on what's happening out there? Do you want me to address that one specific department or just in general? I, 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 well, first, then that's why I asked the, the chair for a little uh, indulgence. I, I think in general is what we do. I don't, I don't think I, that issue is already handled. We've already voted on it. That one's done. But how do, going forward, how do we be a bit more transparent than apparently we have been? Well, I, I, I think everything is very transparent. Um, I think that we have worked very, very closely with Councilman Cooper um, just over the past few months in producing some reports to pre present to this body. And uh, I think that that information is useful. And um, so when you see something on there that looks out of line or you don't uh, believe is trending properly, ask us about it. And there may be a valid reason for that, but uh, it could very well be that we're aware that a deficit is trending. And we're, what you don't realize is that staff is working with that department. And we're having those discussions with those departments when we start to see actual trends, but you can't necessarily identify a trend in a single quarter's report. And it's really uh, important to understand context because particularly for some departments, they have seasonal activity. So it could very well, I'll give you an example, parks. The fiscal year begins in July. They're going to spend a whole lot of money right. over the summer in that first quarter. So when you look at their information just in terms of how it might be presented in a quarterly report, it may appear that they are spending way ahead of the budget. But we know that it's going to take care of itself in quarter two because many of those costs are going to be reduced in the second quarter. So uh, if you have ways that you could help is just is to ask 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 us the question because sometimes you may spot something that we don't that we don't see so right. ask. And, and and i think the challenge for us sitting out here on the floor is this is not a full-time job for us mm -hmm. and you guys have the information available to you at all times mm -hmm. and so what i would just simply ask is if you see that trend if we don't happen to catch it on this floor if you guys would let us know to where okay. we don't we don't sit down on a tuesday or a monday night and all of a sudden say if we don't do it now we can't meet payroll i can i can assure, i can assure you that those folks i talked about when I, in my opening remarks, are looking at that all the time. Good. And I think most departments would come to you and tell you, yes, they're looking all the time, and I don't. <laughs> all right. So given the fact that we have 608 on the on that's going to be up for a, a final vote, perhaps this next Tuesday, we have three hundred thousand dollars in your in your budget for the short term rental properties. Mm -hmm. um, if 608 passes. Uh, What's your contention of the 300,000? Are you still planning on going, not going? What, what's the I, I thought think, there? You know, I think that's, I, I think we, I think we need to be monitoring and I think we need to be enforcing uh, what's out there, whether or not that's 300,000 or something else. I think the city needs my, I believe we need to do something. I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, but, but I just want to understand that in the event 608 passes, you know, are you going to back off of it? Or are we going to stay on task? Mm -hmm. Because I think if 608 passes, I don't think that ends whatever situation there is. We don't, we, I mean, we, we plan to move ahead if you all grant this funding. Okay, and then my final question, Chair, the 201000 for the uh, procurement program, as you're well aware, I, mm -hmm. I brought a bill asking to make sure that we look after Davidson County business mm -hmm. owners, et cetera. Is this a part of, of kind of the policy change uh, in your department, or is this something completely unrelated? This is this is really unrelated to that. This is really just going in and updating that disparity study that was done in 2004, but it would certainly take into account, you know, any 
factor that we think may be impacting um, this group of folks that do business, that want to do business with Metro. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Karen Johnson. One moment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Director uh, Talia Lomax O'Neill, I just want to uh, actually give a shout out um, on behalf of my constituents who have said that um, understanding uh, the budget for Metro has been made uh, to be a lot more uh, user in friendly, user friendly, where people who go to our website to find out where the money goes, um, how we're spending our dollars, uh, has been streamlined and has been made very um, easy to find and to sort through. And so I just wanted to commend you, your leadership and your staff for um, helping our citizens to be able to understand what we come in and look at all of the details on and make decisions on to where they get uh, the meat, so to speak, um, of the budget and understand where our dollars are co uh, going to. So I appreciate that. Um, the other thing is that um, the short-term rental software, yes. um, I've gotten a lot of emails, a lot of calls, People are concerned, they want to make sure that who, whomever we select, and you're saying now that we're only appropriating money and we're at the point where um, we're choosing a vendor? Exactly, we are in the middle of a procurement that has been protested, so I can't really go into okay. a whole lot of detail in terms of uh, beyond that, but um, should that move forward, this is the appropriation that would be needed to implement a software solution. Well, I'm excited about it. A lot of other people are excited. We thank you for including that in the budget. That is a huge concern of many constituents. And uh, again, I appreciate your leadership. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you uh, recognizing the efforts of staff. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Mac, I, I agree with uh, Council Lady Johnson. Uh, the constituents in the Southeast think that your office does a great job. I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the nonprofits, and that was a question we explored a little bit with Mr. Rieberman, but I know you work closely with him. And Councilman Schumann asked where that was located, and he came back and showed me on page 16 at the beginning of the book. And I was going down, and uh, my question is, the nonprofit that made application to your office, is that located on the Community Partnership Fund? That's, that's, uh that process, exactly how that's going to happen, yes, that would be the intent, that that funding and that light on them uh -huh. is where the um, nonprofits in the city would have an opportunity to, to, um, to receive funding from the city. Right. And I guess what I was trying to do is look at the nonprofit candidates that came to your office, uh, not to over... Uh, well, not to kind of supervise in any way, but we would like to know who all made application and those who oh, didn't that, receive. That process, uh, Councilman, has not happened. We have it, not announced uh, that process yet. But you've set Either. aside one million for it? Yes, we have set aside one million for that. Okay. And we'll, when, when would so, that process... So if anybody is concerned out there that may be listening, you have not missed your opportunity. You didn't Good. miss anything. Good deal. And of course, that process that you're talking about, it's, it's going to be out there on the web so everybody can look to see how to make application? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, my second uh, bit of inquiry has to do with, uh, I think it's the three million for your summer education employment program. Okay. Opportunity now. Right. Opportunity okay. now. Um, explain that. I think we're looking for private investors to go along with this, and will this be enough to take us through this fiscal year with the program? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, this current in the current fiscal year, if you recall, the administration uh, budgeted a million dollars for Opportunity Now, and then later in the year we asked for two and a half million because we wanted to go ahead and put the youth to work because the fiscal, you know, the summer, you know, some school is ending and the kids couldn't wait until July to start start their work. Uh, so you'll notice that it has dropped to three million, but the reason it has dropped to three million is because of the overwhelming support that has come, come from the community Good. to contribute 
to the program. Good. And they are making, uh, I don't have the number for me off the top of my head, but the mayor's office could uh, provide that. They are making significant progress on uh, fundraising. Good, I think that's one not way. Not only, you know, so it's not just about hiring people. Many of the companies are just agreeing to hire. There are actually uh, organizations that are contributing dollars to deal. make this initiative uh, a success. That's one good program. And just finally, this uh, question is for the chair. Mr. Chairman, I thought initially when the assessor visited us, um, I felt like uh, Councilman Glover in the sense that if in fact we pass 608 or whatever we're going to do with short-term rental, I thought the assessment and the certified tax rate would be different. And so I'm wondering if it's going to make any sense if we ask the assessor to visit us at some point in time in the future because um, Councilman Glover brought it back, but I thought from day number one we should have had her at the end of the short-term rental process because of I'm particularly interested in the certified tax rate, and I know the mayor said that we won't uh, undergo uh, property tax increase, but I'm not so worried only about this year, but the years come. So I guess uh, somewhere in the back of your mind and uh, Director Jameson's mind, uh, you might want to ponder having the assessor to come back to address where we might be in terms of uh, 608 and all the other short-term rental assessments that will come about. Councilman, I think you make a great point, and I'll ask Rosie to take down the question and get a report back from the assessor. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Specific question. Um, hey, hey, you. And then Councilman Shulman. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Talia, uh, here's my question. I hate to ask the first one, but mm -hmm. I've been looking for that um, audit on Autumn Hills, the performance and the financial. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me where it is, um, and has it completely passed over to the Metro audit? It has completely transitioned to uh, Mr. Swan, who, who should be up here shortly, I think. But uh, we, we actually had um, uh, some meetings with him and we gave him all the information that we had had that we had and so that he could pick it up from there but he can speak to that in in a moment as to status okay and yes. and and it's both pieces it's both the financial in terms of what money was spent during that period of time where it went and also I think there was also that concern about the performance which was concerns about following up making sure that liability insurance was yeah. obtained he, or not obtained, all that type of stuff. Yeah, and, and I think he is covering both, but he'll have to confirm that. But um, the thing the thing that I can, can tell you that finance is continued to be involved in is that I have staff that are going out to those facilities on a routine basis, uh, particularly to look at capital needs and things like that and to make sure that things are as they should be and we, we monitor that on a very frequent basis, and I, I actually get updates on that every couple of weeks on how okay. things are progressing. Okay. okay. And uh, from what I understand, Director, the um, um, things seem to be, at, at least particularly at Autumn Hills, which is where the focus is, mm -hmm. um, I hear that things are going well. And, and, and I am hearing that as well. And, and when something does come to our attention, it is dealt with quickly. Okay. Yes, okay. and because we are doing, we are going out there quite often to um, make sure that that does happen. Okay, um, thank you. Um, this is a question I asked HR the other day, but it's about vacancies. Okay. Uh, does your department keep up with that? Because uh, Human Resources said they didn't know what the number was. Yeah, we do our best to keep up with those vacancies. And let me. Um, uh, Metro does not have a um, what I would consider to be a position control system where you can track positions on a daily basis, who, what's coming and going, but it becomes tricky because departments will sometimes substitute positions. And I'll give you I'll give you an example. Let's suppose that the library has a library in three. I'm just making these up that leaves. They may decide that they don't want to replace that librarian three. They, they want to replace that librarian three with a librarian two. Okay? And, and then what they want to do, and then they want to increase a librarian one to a librarian two. 
So now you still have two positions, but what you have is not a librarian one and a librarian three, you've got two librarian twos. So we, we do this uh, constant kind of chasing between the actual people that are sitting in positions versus uh, what we believe to be the authorized FTE count that you would see in your budget book. And um, we actually are working on a technical solution to try, and to, to, try to remedy that. Um, and uh, we'll need the partnership from HR to make that happen because um, uh, that is an issue for this government because we do our best, uh, the analysts in the budget office actually produce monthly reports to try to keep those, uh, to try to track those. But as you can imagine, people come and go every day. So it's a hard, you know, by the time you, you get it reconciled, the next day it's out of date. Well, I guess my question would be, <laughs> and, and I understand, mm -hmm. understand this better than, uh, mm -hmm. well, we both understand it fairly well. Yes. So the, the idea would be, um, if somebody is, if, if again, the hypothetical, if the library mm -hmm. wants to hire, they have a library three who leaves and they want to hire somebody who's in a library, they want to move that to a library two, don't they have mm -hmm. to ask permission from somebody? Yes, and, that and, that's, and that's why the analysts uh, track that information so that if it gets to a point where they, it looks like they're trying to do a promotion, we have to make sure that the money's there to do it. So that's why it's really important to the finance department to try to keep track of that. Okay, I guess what I'm trying to get at is um, if, uh, and again, I'm just picking on the library, so I'm not picking I, on I, Ken it Oliver. Was, it was my example. It was not, your example. Is, it was my okay, example. Okay, so let's say that they have 100 people that work for the library. They have 100 positions that are available, mm -hmm. but they've only filled 90 of those. Mm -hmm. um, and then next year they come back and they've got 100 positions and they've still only got 90 positions filled. And then the next year, they still have 90 positions I, I quite frankly wouldn't be surprised by that because I think every department has normal attrition. So I think that you have to balance off this tracking of whether or not all those positions are filled versus what might, versus what might be normal attrition for a particular department. And that's not gonna look the same for libraries it might look for public works. All right, well what I'm doing is <laughs> I'm saying it's the same 10 positions that are never filled, okay? It's not normal attrition, what I'm talking about is department just has the budget and they don't fill those positions they just don't fill them they're I vacant. think that's a fair question for a department head to say if you've, if you've been sitting on a position for two years why do you need it that's a fair question that's exactly what I'm getting at so but the question is we don't know what that is right unless I ask every department that comes up here exactly because we have, I, yes I know the chairman would love for me to do that so is there a better <laughs> way for me to do it I mean it sounds like with all due respect, it's an HR question. It's not necessarily a, it's a finance well, because I'm, of the I money. Mean, we both we both should care about it, you know. So I don't want to just say it's all an HR question, but um, well, um, instead of I guess what I'm what I would prefer, and this may go up to the chairman, is I really do not want to come in here and or have somebody ask every department that comes up how many vacancies have you had and are mm -hmm. they the same ones. Councilman, let me make a suggestion mm -hmm. once again, uh, asking Rosie to in our follow-up with all the departments with follow-on questions, let's ask that question for every department. Okay. And try to get an answer back by May the 24th. And, and, and just as a suggestion, uh, you really do need to be very specific with the departments in Understood. terms of what time point, because they will say, as of when. I, I, I understand. I you think will I know. Get, you will get that from. I know exactly what I'm looking for. I've, <laughs> because I've, uh, yeah. I, we, we get those questions as well. Understand. Um, last question. Uh, just back in the administrative section, and I know we found the we found the, uh, the we found that on page 16 in the ordinance. Okay. Um, and this may have been asked by somebody, but um, there's a million dollars um, in the entertainment. It's in the in administrative sections. Yes. It's entertainment. Yes. It's a million dollars. It came down from last year. Yes. What does the million dollars go for? That that is the appropriation that would go to Mr. Um, Ken Burns for. Many of you just uh, left a room with uh, Mr. Burns to do about the country music um, documentary. Part of the and then part of that would be allocated to Nashville. Okay, so it's only a million this year. Can you tell me what the split is? I don't have it off the top of my head. I think it's, yeah, I think it's probably five and five. But let me just. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
just if you can just find out and let me I know. I just hate throwing that out. I'm pretty sure it's five and five, but just let me confirm it. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Director O'Neill. I really appreciate the work that you all do, and I, too, give you all a shout out. And I appreciate uh, you for uh, recognizing my staff the way you did recently. Thank you. My concern is the disparity study. Okay. The disparity, is the b disparity study a metro disparity study? Yes. Okay, so I know that, I, my question is, this is the concern that I have, is that we do the studies and there's no updates or no implementation of the studies when the recommendations come down. And, and oftentimes those studies are set on the shelf. They look good and they are there, but they are of no good because we don't implement the things that have been recommended. Mm -hmm. I recall that, um, that, that a study was done with Mayor Bredesen Mm -hmm. And none of those, and, and the disparity studies came out and showed that there was great disparity. And then Mayor Purcell came and also had a study done and nothing was really done because then when the Human Relations Commission did a study, then it was still pretty similar. Nothing much happened in those studies. So I guess my question is, is that are there any monitoring uh, activities of these studies, and if so, benchmarks are made, and um, and are they uh, are those benchmarks monitored, or and are they reported or shown somewhere where where things have been implemented? Yes, and um, that's when I found out that we were going to ask for this. That's the first question I ask. Uh, first, let me just step back. I think um, you mentioned human relations. What human relations did was not a disparity study. I think what they did was a study of w Metro's workplace diversity. Okay. Okay. So I just want to make sure that you that you know that that's not that's not what this is. Okay. Okay. But um, I was advised that um, I asked them to go back look at every recommendation that was in that last disparity study, again, which was done back in 2004. Boy, you four, said. Mm -hmm. uh, only two things were not implemented. Everything that was recommended in that report got implemented except two items. And I think Michelle, I could tell you what those two things were. Where, where could that information be found? Uh, we can give you that update. I can work with Michelle and we can produce a document and send to this body and tell you uh, a summary of what the recommendations were, what happened, and what didn't happen. Okay. And, and I think that that's, a, that's easily available. Is it not, Michelle? And, my, and, and the other thing is, is that while things may be done on the surface, if, if someone say that we, we did the diversity and we got some uh, partners, say, for instance, a DBE to work with, and they have them there for the first year, but this is a four-year uh, award that they received, and they don't use them. They, you know, conveniently push them I, out. I, I understand what that issue is, and that is a, that's an important issue. I mean, and and Michelle, I don't I don't, I don't know if you want to address this, but uh, I do personally feel like we could be probably a little bit more vigilant in some of that monitoring. But we are constrained by some of the tools available to us in terms of uh, how quickly we can get out there and identify that it that they were there for a year and then they left a year later. So what kind Michelle, of tools? Wanna, yeah. I want to make sure you get you, an opportunity. Thank you. Um, I, I will tell you that we have uh, what I consider to be relatively robust contract compliance monitoring activities in uh, finances business assistance office. Um, we don't monitor every single contract. We have thresholds that we identify for the contracts that we will monitor. But what we do require on contracts is from start to finish, the ones that we do monitor, that the contractors provide us with uh, what we call utilization documentation. That includes canceled checks, 
invoices, other payment documentation that helps us to understand that if they proposed a certain percentage of DBE participation, that they achieved that participation over the life of the contract. So we know also that with various contracts, depending upon the contract and the size of it, the project plan may show that DBE participation at a certain point on the project plan. And we ask those contractors to detail that information for us so that we can stay on top of where to expect the participation so that we don't get behind on it. We're not at the end of the contract and they're saying, hey, we didn't <coughs> achieve the participation that was proposed. So we're looking at it over the life of the contract and we're looking at it in concert with where that participation should be uh, achieved in the project plan for the contract. But again, that's hard, Michelle. So it is, it is I hard. I don't and, want to lead you to believe that that's an easy task. No, and it, it has been <laughs> uh, up until recently, uh, that process was being managed via ac access databases uh, and manual input of data. Uh, now we're using uh, the, the city's uh, iProcurement system uh, to help us manage that to some degree. Uh, Talia's right, there are some data limitations even with that system uh, because there is still some manual process, some of which we talked about related to our benchmarking analysis. Uh, that you know that staff has to engage in so it is manual to some degree but we do identify certain dollar threshold contracts that we are for certain gonna monitor over the life of that contract I would really like to see that and, and I'd like to know those numbers because um, I've been getting different information in terms of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the participation. Yes. And, and I know that once upon a time, there was less than 1% of uh, DBEs mm -hmm. receiving contracts from Metro and, and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, I would really we be can, interested. We can absolutely get that to you. That information is presented uh, to the Procurement Standards Board on a re regular basis. Mm -hmm. And Council Lady, I think you're making terrific points. And uh, again, I'm looking at the commitment here mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. diversity officer to come back and have a special hearing on all of these topics as yes. soon as possible. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Council Lady Allen. Thank you. Um, getting to one of my favorite topics, short-term rental. Can I ask Mr. Mason if he can maybe make a statement about what the state allows with regard to the assessment of commercial property and what constitutes commercial property? Is that a fair question to ask you to? That may answer the question that Council Member Glover was asking earlier about. I, do, I or, don't have, I won't have the answer for you. I'll have that for you tomorrow. I did want to clarify that we are not on third reading on 608. We had the public hearing, but second was deferred. So we'll have second reading. second reading right. Tuesday and then third reading at some point after that. I'll okay. Have the commercial rate information for you tomorrow. Okay. I guess my my I, my understanding was that it, it gets down to how many incomes you get from a piece of property and has nothing to do with how long it rents. Is that then that state law? Is that something you're still researching? Right. Okay. We'll ask that one later. And then secondly, um, this may not be the right department to ask the question of, but in in looking through um, the budget, I see a, a STR transfer fee in one year that showed it going to the Barnes Fund, but I don't see it being handled the same way in tell this me, year's budget. Tell me which page you're on. So, um, you can tell me exactly where you are. Hold on. Try to help you out. Okay, on page seven in the, I think it's the budget ordinance where it breaks it down. So this may not be a fair question to be asking finance, who but. Who knows, I may know it. That'd be so nice. Page seven uh, under revenue source, um, General Services estimated revenue and fund balance supporting appropriations. So I think it's under the heading of other taxes, licenses, and permits that bleeds so, over uh, into page seven. It's uh, okay, item 40333. 40333. You're saying you see a trend? No, I, no, yeah. that's not. That's the permit. No, that's <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have moved my pages around. There was a... <clears throat> I'll have, maybe, I may have you to want to just step to the side. We probably can answer it for you while we're here. We'll do that one later. Sounds good. Okay. I just want to make sure it's still happening, and I can't see where it moves into the Barnes Fund. I would just like to be able to find that. I'll, oh, the Barnes Barnes Fund. Right. <laughs> we can we can do that <laughs> offline if that's better. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, 
Director Ledmax O'Neill, I wanted to ask, um, and I'm not sure if it's appropriate to your finance department hearing, but um, I'd had two inquiries from constituents and looked at an article um, in yesterday's Tennessean regarding um, uh, fees that we pay mm -hmm. for pension fund management. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've just briefly read that article, and I didn't know if you just wanted to uh, speak to that briefly as to what you were going to um, do to, to track those for additional transparency. Yeah. Uh What's going on with that generally as a topic, this is, this is really a national topic in terms of, um, of how public pension plans are reporting those fees. There are some, there's at least one template that's been, defined, that's been developed nationally that some folks um, have started to use to report those fees. But what I'm finding is that many jurisdictions are taking that template even and tweaking it to fit their own purposes. So it's an emerging topic in terms of being transparent around those fees. Uh, I do think I, I do think it's the right thing to do. Uh, when I when I spoke with the uh, the reporter, I think I characterized it to him. I said it's like a Gatsby pronouncement. You know, they go in and they decide that you know this is an important issue. It requires disclosure. We think it's important enough to to come up with a new reporting requirement about including that, okay? And I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. I don't think that there is a national consensus about what that needs to look like because it, it is really important that whatever you decide to report, that it's consistent with other, what other governments are reporting. Otherwise, you're exactly where you are today, which means you're not looking at an apples to apples comparison when you look at what's going on in Nashville versus city A, B, or C. So, um, so you know, I, I, uh, there, was, there have been some governments, again, that, that just, they, they were early adopters and they tried to do something and they are, and so they are publishing information. But I do think if you look at some of those jurisdictions, the reporting varies greatly. Uh, so um, uh, lacking a standard guidance or something, I, th I think it's important that we as a city do get together. And you know, this is not Talia Lomax O'Neill's call, so let me make sure that I'm very clear on that. This is a, a function of the investment committee of the benefit board, so we as a group, would have to decide what that uh, disclosure needed to be, what needed to be included, how it needed to be disclosed, and as a committee, we would need to decide what that looks like and make that information available to um, to the you know to to everyone that is a member of the plan. They deserve to know that um, is is um, is my opinion. So um, I'm committed to working with the board as the chair of that committee to for trying to get a consensus from the group about how we want to report that information to our pensioners. Do you think from a timeline perspective, I know you need to kind of see what peer cities are doing and consider how you're gonna report that back out, but do you think that's something that you'll take up in the next month or two as a committee, uh, the, and then what the, would you, the your time frame be to kind of report back? The investment committee back? gets together quarterly. Okay, quarterly, um, that's good to know. Tom, are you, are you aware when we get back together, do you know, off the top of your, I'm sorry to call you out, but is that May? I think it's uh, late, late this month is our next scheduled meeting, so we'll bring that up as a topic and we'll, we'll start talking about, um, this, yeah, I, can't, I can't imagine what the other committee members might think, so I don't want to commit them to okay. some kind of timeline. Understood, line. but if you were to take it up at May committee, then perhaps by next quarterly meeting, you would be, I don't want to, maybe knowing what I mean, a strategy I just, would I just, be. You know, I've got to get them to agree with me first. You know that okay. it's the the right thing to do. So, um, um, to, I, I don't want to commit to a timeline, but it, I can commit to as chair of that board that I'll keep it on the agenda and try to and be really aggressive about um, trying to make a decision and not let it languish. I, I can commit that. to that. I appreciate that. That. Thank you. Um, and several of my colleagues pointed me to the um, general services district fund and kind of we're, we're breaking things out um, in, in revenues. Okay, um, if you can just make sure I'm on the same page with okay, you, okay? so I'm on page. Uh, Are you in the ordinance or a budget book? I am in the ordinance, yes, okay. thank you, on page um, seven. And I know some of my colleagues may have addressed this prior um, to my arrival, so if this is redundant, please just let me know. 
um, but I'm seeing revenue for a short-term rental permit at 65,000. Yes. And that's. Well, that's that's not everything. That's just the permit portion. I mean, that's just the this fifty is, dollar is permit. Right. This is this is the short term fees. They're broken out amongst several different categories. Understood. So it may be useful for us just to give you a little summary. Okay. Thank you. Would that be helpful to you? That would be very helpful. I okay. appreciate that. Uh, we'll commit to just kind of giving you guys a so you don't have to try to dig through. 200 line items to find them. Okay, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> and then as well in uh, on page six in the ordinance, taxes, licenses, permits, mm -hmm. um, uh, arborist license, um, one line item at $100. Um, right. I understood in some kind of researching some things around our tree ordinance, um, are arborists supposed to be um, having that, that license annually? I, I don't. I don't know the schedule off okay. the top of my head, but we can. We can certainly. We could. We could get that for you before you leave. I'd appreciate knowing that. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. And then looping back, Councilman Shulman. Yeah. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, Director. Uh, um, I meant to say this before. All those uh, the personnel questions that I was asking. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think that um, the chair of our personnel committee, Kathleen Murphy, has been also looking for that type of information. Okay. So what I'd like to do is make sure that whatever we get answered, and I'll direct this to the chairman and to Roseanne Hayes, needs to go back to uh, Council Lady Murphy, who I think is responsible for this stuff. So anyway, I just want to make that point. Uh, Thank we'll you. Ju we'll just make sure it gets to council. Make sure she gets to <laughs> make sure it gets to her and everyone else. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman and Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. And, I, and this is a question not to uh, the finance director, but I, I think I'd like to follow up on uh, Councilman Schulman's uh, questioning that he's doing. If we don't have uh, positions filled and they go unfilled repeatedly, is there a way, and here's the question, uh, Roseanne, is there a way that we as a body can ask that number, that, that dollar amount to go into our reserve funds to help pay down our debt? Um, because I can tell you, serving on another board before I got to this body, uh, there are positions that do go unfilled. And if there's a way that we can start paying down the debt that we have, if we're not, if we're not uh, filling those positions and we can utilize that money to pay down our debt, I'd just like to know what the possibility is, A, and B, I mean, it, it, is it even realistic? And so thank you for indulging that question, Chair. Um, thank you. Did the director want to? Take a crack at answering that. My guess is the director will say pass an ordinance. Well, I, what, 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 I specifically said I wasn't going to ask her to answer okay. the question. That's what I heard, Council. And, and I think, and because I, I, but, but I would like to explore that, I, Mr. Chair. I, let's put that in our, our ordinance uh, idea box. Yeah. And with that, a um, couple of things. No one else in the queue. I want to thank our wonderful finance director for being here. And then everybody, uh, members of the committee, um, we're going to adjust the s schedule a little bit to accommodate people's schedules. And we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask chairman of committees and the vice chairman of Verger to um, chair the hearings, but we're going to skip ahead a little bit. We're going to have the Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Schultz, if you don't mind coming forward. Uh, next, at 515, we're going to ask Mark Swan and John Cooper, our enormously patient people, uh, to wait. We're going to ask um, Nancy, Chairman Nancy Van Rees to come and chair the, the Chamber of Commerce meeting. And then Matt Wilshire has agreed to come back at another time, not to avoid an appearance before us, but to have the appropriate amount of time with economic and development. So we'll go in the order of the Chamber of Commerce and then Internal Audit and Metro Legal chaired by Vice Chairman Vircher, and then on to the Public Safety Vice Chair Roberts for the Beer Board, uh, Chairman Murphy for the Human Relations Committee, Chairman Allen for the Planning Commission, and Chairman Coleman for the Codes.